walk in the cloud. It's a matter of some debate whether we're all living through the fourth or the fifth industrial revolution, but there's general agreement about where and when the first one happened, England in the 1800s. And if you're looking for a cradle of that revolution, you could turn your eyes towards Birmingham. I'm Ellen Bencard, and that's where we're heading on today's Walk in the Cloud. Birmingham Tech Week channels the spirit, growth, and energy of that original boom into a series of events focusing on today's potential. And there is plenty of it. We decided to do a live recording of this podcast there. We were introduced by the very impressive applied futurist Tom Cheesewright, who threw proceedings over to me to talk to Accenture's Tom White. Tom, thank you for, for joining us. Why... Why should we be listening to you, Tom? What do you do? Well, well that's, that's, a, that's a question I've asked myself this morning, actually. Um, so, yes, I'm Tom White. I'm the head of strategy and growth for Accenture Technology in the UK. So I'm a software engineer by trade. Uh, I, uh, one of the leadership team of a business that we call Accenture Next Generation Engineering. So uh, I spend my time with customers building modern cloud-native products and services, um, some of the organizations who are represented here today. Uh, and as of today, I'm a podcaster. This will either be the start and end of that career. So let's see how we get on. So Tom laid down a fantastic foundation stone for us, and I want to build on that. Um, let's start with AI, which I suspect there's not a presentation today that isn't going to mention it. But you're at the coalface. You're out talking to clients all the time. Cut through the hype bubble that we're at the top of right now. What's actually going on? How are people using this and thinking about it? Yeah, sure. So, look, I, th I, think, I think the starting point for thinking about AI is we need to recognize where it's come from and where it's going. Okay, so AI is a concept that's been around since the 50s. And between then and today, it's been in go fast mode. It's been in go slow mode. There's been decades where not much has been achieved in terms of academic or technological breakthroughs. And then last year, <laughs> we had the, the iPhone moment for AI, and it's gone into light speed. So ChatGPT dropped. All of a sudden, it's front and center of mind for everybody from uh, university students through to the boardroom. I'm sure many of you will have heard it was the fastest ever application to get to 100 million users. So there's a huge amount of hype and excitement, like you say. Um, just to sort of bring it back to the, the here and now and uh, what I'm seeing and experiencing with our customers, what AI is really driving is a renewed focus on digital, okay? Because to get to value from AI, fundamentally you need data, a lot of it. You need some other stuff like accelerated compute, which maybe we can get into, but you need data, you need the ability to access that data, and that really means getting that data into a modern data platform, probably on the public cloud, you need interoperability between your systems and your partner systems. And to answer your question directly, the reality is very few organizations are there yet unless they were born in the cloud. So, um, And what are the typical things that people need to do to get that digital core up to speed so they have the data they need for this AI dream to come true? Yeah, so all of us will be familiar with the term digital transformation. But I think you can think about it in two waves. So. Um, you know, with the, perhaps with the exception of organizations who are digital native and were born in the cloud, digital is really only into sort of the perimeter of most enterprise organizations. So they're customer facing applications, maybe some of the B2B or B2C apps, uh, perhaps applications used in a, in, in a call center. I can give many examples, but uh, the common theme across all of them is when you really get into the nitty gritty systems of record, the mainframe, the applications built on languages that some of the younger folk in the room have probably never heard of, that's not digital, okay? And those systems are more often than not the ones that hold the data, and when that data is curated and inspected in the right way, the insight, okay? So it's about getting access, the, the digital core is about getting access to that data and being able to service it to your end users and then get some intelligence from it. And it's that scenario that you really get an advantage from with AI. So I want to push you past AI because that's 
actually very much today's technology, and we're talking about technologies of tomorrow, and I know that your bet is on something else. Yes, so um, I, don't think the, uh, I don't think the bookies will take bets on this, but uh, if I was a betting man, the, the real excitement for me is around what quantum will do for AI. So quantum computing uh, blows my mind. I don't understand it, but I can, I can share a little bit of insight that I've, 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 managed to, uh, I've managed to gleam. So look, we're in the West Midlands, the home of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, and that industrial revolution was powered by what? Steam. Thank you, steam. So it was the, it was the age of steam. It was steam that fundamentally unlocked that wave of, um, that wave of technological advancement and value to the organizations that were, were prevalent at the time. So what's, what's the equivalent today? Well, today is the age of, what do we all have in our, pho in our pockets? We hit our we phones. Uh, silicon knife driven iPhones. We, we, we have phones uh, of, uh, of any vendor of choice. And within those phones are silicon chips, as you will find in all computers. And what's happened to computers over the last 10 years is they've got faster, and they've got smaller, and they've got cheaper. That means they can process more data, and they can do more things at once, and they don't have blue screens of death, and they don't run out of memory, and all this good stuff. And they're super, super reliable. But there's a problem. That can't keep happening forever because the laws of physics, those pesky things <laughs> that uh, uh, we live by and they govern, they govern the universe we operate in, they're gonna get in the way. So eventually transistors will get so small down to the width of just a handful of atoms, they can't get any smaller. And what happens then? Computers will stop getting faster or perhaps not at the same rate that we've got used to. And that's where quantum comes in, because quantum computers don't use uh, what's called a digital architecture, okay? So they don't use silicon, they don't use bits, traditional bits, ones and zeros. They use qubits or quantum bits, and those take advantage of the mind-bending properties of quantum mechanics, things like spin and superposition, and being in the same place at the same time and tunneling. Okay, so make this real for me. Give yes. me some use cases as to how to... How does this then translate to the real world? Yeah, so, I mean, look, to make it real, this isn't, uh, it's pr probably not quite in, uh, in uh, the, other, the other Tom's world. I mean, this is here now, okay? Over the break at lunchtime, you could log into a public cloud provider and access a supercomputer, okay? So the, the, the hardware is real, to, real and it's there now. What's not there now is the uh, scaled real world applications of it. So. Uh, quantum computers are great for certain problems. I won't go into the, uh, the weeds of uh, what they're good for and what they're not good for. But let's just say it's not going to help your Google homepage load faster, okay? It's, it's a specialized type of computing. And wherever there's a problem that needs you to take huge numbers of variables into consideration, quantum computers are brilliant at it, okay? Hundreds of thousands or millions of times faster than a traditional computer. So when you think about what industries that could apply to, drug discovery. Okay, modeling how atoms interact. Supply chains, working out complex routing of supply chains around the world. Or finance, okay, taking in lots of different variables and understanding how to manage risk or price financial instruments or things like this. And these are all industries that are so prevalent across the West Midlands. So I know I could talk to you about this the whole time, but moving on, let's talk skills because obviously moving to quantum, it's gonna be like moving from the boatman who used to run on this canal to railroads. Totally different set of skills. How do we develop them and, and how is the UK doing, and the West Midlands specifically, in getting to those skills? Okay, so the, 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 there's, there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of parts of that, so you might, mean, you might need to rein me back in a little bit here. Um, okay, so, so firstly, on, on the quantum side, uh, the West Midlands is leading. So the, the government has a national quantum strategy. It's just founded um, National Quantum Centre in Oxfordshire, uh, and there's various different locations around the UK that have got particular areas of specialism. Birmingham University, for example, hosted the National Quantum computing hackathon this year, uh, and they took real-world use cases from across those industries that I mentioned, from prominent uh, industry partners who are based here in the West Midlands, and they, be, they built real-world uh, solutions to uh, business challenges that those organizations face today. So 
on the, on, the, on the quantum side, look, it's early days, but the region is uh, well up there and, uh, and, and leading in the UK. And what types of skills are we talking about? How, is it a different way of thinking? Yeah, so um, it, oh, look, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require um, the, sim the same journey that we've been on for digital, I think, will happen again. Okay, so, you know, we're currently going through a bit of a transformation in the education sector where there's a real premium on on, uh, on STEM skills, uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths in universities. I think the, the education sector has done a brilliant job of uh, waking up to that, but we haven't quite had enough time for the talent and the people to go through that system. So I think, I, I think I'd say it's, a, it's kind of four or five out of five on having the platform to be able to get to digital skills, but maybe a three out of five in terms of where we are on that journey, because we just need a bit more time for um, our traditional um, so, sort of non-STEM and um, and more. Uh, what's the what's the what's the word I'm searching for here? Humanities. Thank you. Uh, Humanities-based. Um, My uh, world. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and talk to me about the challenge of training those of us who are in the workplace right now, because I know you're doing work with clients, and Accenture itself is doing a lot of in-house training. What can we do today? Yeah, sure. So look, the. The skills and training focus today, uh, well, in fact, look, the, the skills and training focus in general, and what we're really talking about here is what do we need now, what do we need next, okay? So um, I'm sure at Birmingham Tech Week, uh, for those who were here, we'd, you'd have heard talk about digital skills last year. There'll be talk about digital skills today, tomorrow, and it'll be here next year, right? So it's the substance within that that, that matters. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to recognize that the the demands on people who are reskilling this year alone are very different to what they were two years ago. Okay, so if you maybe think about it in terms of having foundational digital skills, you know, how to use mobile applications, uh, internet applications, understanding interconnectivity between them, things like this, you know, that's, it's very different to what you might describe as needing digital for today, which is gonna need much higher levels of data fluency, starting to get your head around some of the underlying technologies of things like chat GPT and large language models. So I think that's the first point. The goalposts are moving. We should just, we should just accept that. But when we talk about skills, we kind of have to get into the, the weeds about what do we really mean. In terms of what's happening here in the West Midlands, I mean, well, I mean, th there are collaboration and partnerships happening everywhere. So I could, I'll talk to the one that I'm close to, which is, uh, Accenture has uh, something that we call the School of Tech Futures, which is about taking people through uh, an immersive sort of multi multi week training program. Uh, it's something that we do with our own uh, staff and colleagues. So we take our graduates and we put them through it, but we also offer it in universities. So here in the West Midlands, uh, we, we trialed it uh, this year and last year with Aston University. It took something like 80 students through the first cohort, and I think there's another 100 signed up for next year. But it's not, it's not just us, right? There's, there's lots of professional services organizations, uh, some of our technology partners who are represented here today. Um, you know, it's a real uh, hotspot of collaboration between industry, uh, between the education sector, and between government. I'm going to interrupt our walk there because we'd rather leave you hanging than drone on for longer than you have time to listen. Next episode, I'm going to be back with Tom and the second part of our conversation in Birmingham, where we move on to sustainability and more talk about the tech skills before Tom and I, back in our home offices, reflect on what we learned from our stroll through the heart of the West Midlands. Walk in the cloud.